It's all yours, Pop. Sign here. Certainly, Pop. Just goes to show you, Pop. Dan Gordon. Boy, that guy had it made. He had everything. Had a yacht, a stable of racehorses, dames. He had a list of dames he ate long. Now look at him. Just another one of your cousins. You treat him nice, Pop. You talk nice to him. Make him feel right at home, huh? I'll do my best, Pop. <laughs> <laughs> They think it's a joke, Mr. Gordon, by talking to you. But we know better, don't we? You can hear me all right? Oh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Wait just a minute. Big shock, Mr. Gordon. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get used to being dead, isn't it? Now, the first thing to do is to be calm. Tell yourself it's perfectly natural to be dead. Oh, yes, yes. Later, you'll be going on someplace else. But, well, right now, it... It might help if we talked a little. All right, tell me anything you want to. When you have things on your conscience, it sometimes helps to tell someone about them. Yes, indeed. But rather the sort of thing one would expect to be offered by a psychiatrist to a patient who, who is still breathing and in surroundings such as these. But Pop Jenkins can hardly be described as a pillar of the medical profession, with an upholstered office and a custom-made contour couch. For his purposes, however, I'm sure that he prefers the the quiet dignity of the morgue and the solid support of a well-refrigerated slab. I might also mention that he has one distinct advantage over his accredited colleagues. You see, his patients can never, never become violent. Imagine being able to carry on a tete-a-tete -tete with a cadaver. How fascinating. Well, tonight we have two stories for you about people who can do just that. And for reasons which must be apparent already, we call our play Dialogues with Death. Our players are Norma Crane, Ed Nelson, Estelle Winwood, And your obedient servant as Colonel Jackson Beauregard Fentress and Pop Jenkins. Now settle back. Listen. Listen very carefully. You may find that you were one of the gifted.
Tom. Oh, yeah, Shadowbug, come on in. Take a look at this. Yeah, that was a good story. What about it? It was a good story, is right. Second day, the police promised an early arrest. Third day, all suspects cleared. Police baffled. The biggest story of the summer at Dice Thomas. What are we going to dig up for tomorrow? That's a good question. What? You and I are going to take a little trip down to the morgue. We'll get a couple of shots of Dan Gordon on his slab. We'll make a center spread out of it. We'll surround it all with pictures of his yacht, the girls, the racehorses, even the time he was tried for murder. Over it all, we'll run a banner. Was it worth it, Dan? <laughs> hey, that's not bad. You know what else? We could use a quote from Gray's Elegy. You know, the boast of heraldry, the pomp of power, all that beauty, all that wealth there gave, awaits like the inevitable hour, the paths of glory lead but to the grave. Yeah, that's good. Get your camera. Come on. Frank, this place gives me the creeps. That's just your imagination. Now, Billy, you mustn't be frightened. The first thing to do is to be calm. And tell yourself this is all perfectly natural. He's talking like this all right. I've been here 40 years, and I've seen lots who took it just the way you're doing. Yes, I do, I do understand. It's hard He thinks he's talking to somebody else. He's dead. He's really off his tracks. Oh, yes. There is some place you go on to from here, but it's not a place that you have to be afraid of. You take my word. Hey, Pop. Pop James. Oh, Tom. Harry. Yeah, who were you talking to? Bill Watkins. He's in 38. Sold papers down on Main Street for 30 years. Everybody liked him. You don't really think you talk to your customers, do you? Oh, not to their bodies, I don't. I talk to them, the real them. Been on the job a long time, Pop. You need to change. I don't blame you for being skeptical. But it's just because I have been here so long that puts me closer to them than most people. But what can I do for you? Well, we're here to get a couple of shots of Danny Gordon in all his present glory. Oh. He's in 36. Do you mind if they take your picture, Mr. Gordon? It's all right. He doesn't mind. Oh, that's nice. All right, Harry, get a couple of good shots, will you? Sure. Just as long as you don't want any action pictures. Well, you talk to all your customers when they come in, Pop? Only if they feel like it. I never bother them. They'd rather not. I guess you had a uh, nice long chat with Dan Gordon. Oh, it? yes. You know, being killed took him completely by surprise. Well, yeah, I bet it did. He had a lot on his mind. Made him feel better to tell me about it. I don't suppose he knew who killed him, though, eh? oh, oh, yes, yes. You see, after you leave this plane, you know a lot of things that were secrets before. You mean that uh, Dan Gordon told you who killed him? Why, yes. He said that... Oh. I shouldn't have said that. Okay, Tom, we can go now. Wait just a second, Harry. Who was it killed Dan Gordon, Pop? <laughs> Please, Tom, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to. Say, what is this? Well, Harry, uh, Pop here had a nice long chat with Dan Gordon after he was killed. Isn't that right, Pop? Yes, that's true, but I can't. Aw, oh, come off it, Tom. Let the old boy alone. Quit kidding him. And let's get out of here. This place gives me the creeps. Yeah, well, Harry, that's because you're not uh, close to the customers the way Pop is here. Now, who was it that killed Dan Gordon, Pop? Please, Tom, don't ask me. I mustn't tell you. No one is supposed ever to know. Well, this thing is really just your imagination, isn't it? You don't really talk to anybody but yourself. Now, come on, admit it. That's not true. I did talk to Mr. Gordon. He said Professor McFarland out at the university shot him and... Oh! McFarland. McFarland, that name mean anything to you? McFarland at the university. John McFarland. I took a picture of him two years ago for winning a pistol shooting championship. He was a big army hero of some kind. Oh, wait a minute, Tom. What are we talking about? Pop doesn't know anything. Yeah, well, uh, let me handle this. 
Hey, look, Pop, why should a man like Professor McFarlane kill a hoodlum like Danny Gordon? I don't suppose it matters what I tell you now. Mr. Gordon says it is because of the professor's sister. His sister? She was a singer. Mr. Gordon had a nightclub and gave her a job. And he became attracted to her and... It's not very pleasant to talk about. I don't know what this is all about. But three months ago, there was a real cute blonde singing at the Club Gordon. She called herself Mac. Gloria Mac. Mac from McFarland. She lasted there two weeks. She just disappeared. It's very interesting. Pop, now that you told us this much, I, I don't suppose you could tell us where we could find the gun McFarland used. It's... It's in the lower right-hand drawer of his desk, his home out at the university. But, Tom, Mr. Gordon says to tell you he doesn't blame the professor. And, Tom, you, you won't try to make any use of what I told you, will you? I know, Pop. I wouldn't dream of it. Harry, I think it's time we... Uh... Well, uh, you take care of yourself, Pop. We'll see you down, eh? Mr. Gordon. I've never discussed what this told me with anyone before. I hope no harm will come of it. What is it? Uh, my name is Ellison. This is Harry Jarvis. We're from the Morning Chronicle. I wonder if we could come in for a minute. Well, I am rather busy. Well, we were checking on a story about your sister. My sister? Yeah, we wouldn't want to print anything without confirmation from you. Very well. Come in. Thanks. Right in here. My study. Sit down, please. Now, just what is this about my sister, Mr. Ellison? Well, she's a singer, isn't she? Uses the name Gloria Mack. Why do you ask? Well, we were told she appeared at Danny Gordon's supper club a couple of months ago. What if she did? Well, Danny Gordon is dead, Professor. I read that in the newspapers. But I don't see how it concerns my sister, nor me, as a matter of fact. Now, if you'll excuse me, I really do have a lot of work to do. Look, uh, where's your sister now? I asked you to go, Mr. Ellison. Look, I hadn't intended to be so blunt about this, but we were told that you killed Danny Gordon because he mistreated your sister. Dan Gordon was human carrion, Mr. Ellison. He deserved what he got, much worse, in fact. And that's all I have to say to you now or ever. Will you please go? You mind, Professor? Give me that. Is this Gloria Mack? Give me that picture. Take it easy, Professor. I easy. Give me that. Yes, sir. <laughs> Professor, yes, sir. It's all right, Harry. I found something a lot more interesting. Right where we were told it would be. Now, that's my personal property. You put that back where you found it. Professor, I believe this is the gun that killed Danny Gordon. You give me that. Now, I'm going to keep this gun even if I have to use it. If I'm wrong, you can sue the paper. Everybody does. I shall. First, I'm calling the police. Now, you, you do that. Hey, Tom. Tom, you think we... Come on, Harry. We got what we came for. Operator, give me the police. Ask for Captain Rogers. Give me my regards. <laughs> called the cops. We ought to meet them about now. He didn't call the cops. That was a bluff. It was a beautiful bluff, but it was a bluff. 
took an awful chance in there. Walking out with that gun. Not after you recognize the picture of his sister. Harry, we've got the gun that killed Gordon. This whole thing ties together. He has to be the killer. He's an expert shot. He has the motive, and he's smart enough to do it. It's true, I don't have any proof. Not until ballistics check the gun for us. But I tell you, I know. Somehow, I, uh, I just know. Call it anything. Call it reporter's instinct. Harry, we're on the biggest story of our lives. Okay, maybe, but I don't like it. I don't like anything about this whole deal. What do you mean you don't like it? We've got Gordon's killer. I mean there's something screwy. How did Pop Jenkins know about McFarland in the first place? How did he know where that gun was? Answer that. Oh, don't give me that jazz about Gordon reviving and talking to him, because I won't buy it. All right. We'll go by the morgue on the way back. Have another little talk with Bob Jenkins. Okay. And this time, get some straight answers. Okay. No more hocus pocus about him talking to his customers. Tom, look out! That guy's on the road! <laughs> is already gone. A passing motorist saw the wreck. That's good. But the gun, it was where you said it be. Yes, I know it was. But how? I gotta know how. I know what some answers, some good answers. And no more hocus pocus about talking to those stiffs. Hey, Pop, we just brought you in a few more customs. Excuse me, Tom. I'll answer all your questions in just a moment. Hey, what do you say about me coming, huh? Right away, Bert. Oh, there you are, Pop. We tucked them in nice and neat for you. Numbers 33 and 34. All you gotta do is sign the ticket. Uh-huh. You know, if this fog gets any worse, we might have a couple more for you before morning. Come on, Joe. Tom. Pop, oh, some answers. in the wreck.
Tom. With that, that you'd already started trying to come for help. So you just kept on trying until you got here. Then I'm... I'm sorry. You see, boys, that information you got me to give you, well, it just wasn't meant for anyone living to make use of. And that hitchhiker you saw, you know who he was. Now, boys, you mustn't be frightened. The first thing to do is to be calm. Tell yourself that this is all perfectly natural. first to realize that you're dead, but you'll get over it. example of communication with the dead. I wonder just how many of you believe that it can actually be true. What? You're only half convinced. Well, if what you're about to see fails to convince you completely, then I'm afraid I must refuse to accept any responsibility whatsoever. Very well. Let us adjourn to a setting which uh, in its own cheerful way, bridges the gap between life and death every bit as effectively as the more. More repose. A plantation which once wore the crown of antebellum splendor. But now, rigor mortis has set in. It has been captured in the coffin of time and sealed in the shroud of the swamp. Yes, my friends, at more repose, you will be confronted with the final proof. Colonel Jackson? Yes, Sister Emily? There's a car coming up the road. I don't hear anything. It's coming quite slowly on account of the chuck holes in the road. Maybe the lawyer's about nephew Charles to stay. That was all settled weeks ago when Charles died. Did I tell you I talked to Charles last night? How was he? Almost ready to go on. Here's the car. I do wonder who that is. Someone took the wrong road? No, they've stopped. If it's someone to visit, we must let them in. Why, of course, Sister Emily. I'll admit them. Just a swamp owl, man. Quite harmless. Won't you all come in? We're going in, Nell. Otto! 
don't think I have the honor of knowing your name. Well, you mean you don't remember me, Colonel? Well, no, I don't rightly believe I do, sir. Well, here's Aunt Emily. I bet she'll know me. Well, I declare. Why do you call me Aunt Emily, young man? Sister Emily? I do believe it's Daniel. Our nephew, Daniel. Daniel? Is you really Daniel? You don't mean you forgot your loving youngest nephew. Well, I'm hurt. I'm truly hurt. Why, of course you're Daniel. Welcome home, Daniel. We didn't recognize you because you're dead. <laughs> well, thank you. But I'm not dead, as you can plainly see. Oh, but you are, boy. You were killed in a holdup in Chicago. The police wired your brother Charles. The police made a little mistake, and I, I found it convenient to let it stand. Well, let me introduce you to my wife, Nell. This is my aunt, Emily Fentress. Hello, Aunt Emily. And this here is my uncle, Colonel Jackson Beauregard Fentress. I'm pleased to meet you, I'm sure. My pleasure, ma'am. Well, uh, Aunt Emily, aren't you going to greet my wife? I was just thinking you're a lovely child. Red hair and green eyes, a true witch girl. What a pity you died so young. What do you mean by that? The dead go with the dead. Daniel is dead, so you must be too. Would you tell her to cut out that dead business? <sighs> That's enough of that now, Aunt Emily. Look, you might as well both know why I'm here. As the last male of Jean, I come to collect the money that Brother Charles left. But uh, we, we had a long drive, and we kind of tired, and we're going up to my old room and sleep there tonight. Why, of course, Daniel. Tomorrow we'll talk about the money. Though I'm afraid your room may be a little dusty. We, we'll make out. Oh, uh, may I, Colonel? Uh, well, we'll see you in the morning. Come on, now. Uh, good night. Sure is good to be home again. Well, this is truly a surprise, having Daniel home again. And with a wife. A very fetching wife. Oh, Daniel always had an eye for pretty girls. I wonder how she died. <laughs> Danny, let's get out of here. This place gives me the creeps. Yeah, I know that, honey. Come on, in here. This is my old room. Open the door. A little dusty. Well, get your coat off. Make yourself comfortable. Oh, big deal. Big deal. You told me we were going to Miami. Oh, no. I said my repos was near Miami. And it is. It's only one hour by air. Well, it might as well be a million miles away. Well, wait a minute, we won't have to stay here for one night. By tomorrow, we'll have the money. Well, I am telling you that one night is too many. Get your coat off, like I said. Now, wait a minute. Look, a little dust never hurt nobody. There you are. Sheet's clean enough. And we're gonna make out just fine. Say, what's with this aunt of yours? What do you mean? Well, nothing. Nothing's with her. Nothing? The way she keeps saying we're dead? Well, I told you she was a little peculiar. Peculiar? She is out of her skull. Now, that's a fine way for you to talk about your husband's kinfolk. And what about that coot colonel? Oh, boy. What a cute family I married into. Now, look, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Get those drapes over, let a little fresh air in here. to get out of this flea bag. This whole southern mansion. You made it all sound so ritzy. Well, it was ritzy. It was ritzy once. The swamp does things to houses. And the people, too. Colonel making his music. <laughs> That's the only way he gets his kicks anymore. Well, it sounds like a funeral. A cheap funeral. It does, does it there? Come on, uh, it's time to hit the sack. 
Not tomorrow. Or we'll go out on a treasure hunt. Danny, listen, I... Listen, you know, you know the way you were talking this morning, that this would be a good hiding place for three weeks and the police wouldn't trace us here? Yeah. Well, no dice, honey. Tomorrow we get the money and we cut out. Right? Huh? All right. All right. Tomorrow we'll go. In two days, in two days we'll be in South America. <laughs> Come on. It's just Spanish moss. It ain't gonna hurt you, man. I wouldn't bet on it. It's a parasite. Kills the trees, that's all. This is Bayou Jacques, named for my great-great-grandfather. There's over 100 miles of water around here like this. Originally, the only way to get here was by p with Indian guides. Oh, that must have been poultry. Danny, what's that? What's that? Oh, that's a family mausoleum. See, the ground down here is too wet to bury them in the usual way. Well, the stories I could tell you about my revered ancestors in there. Grandfather Jules, for one. What about him? The barrel has to take place kind of quick down here, see, on account of the climate. Well, with Grandfather Jules, it kind of took place too quickly. He wasn't quite ready for it. You mean they buried him alive? Well, something like that. They, uh, call it catalepsy. Well, then Emily heard him hollering for help. Then what? Don't hang me up like that. Well, she'd come down here to see if she could help him out. Well, was he still alive? Well, I didn't wait around to see. I ran as soon as I slammed the door. You shut dear old Aunt Emily up in there with a corpse? Yeah. See, during the night, Aunt Emily heard him calling for help. She'd come down and see if she could help him out. He begged her to open up the coffin and let him out, but she didn't, see? She knew he was dead. Ever since then, she swore she could talk with the dear departed. That sure was a swell way to treat dear Aunt Emily. Well, it was just a joke. How was I to know the old coot wasn't dead? Anyway, we we let her out in the morning. <laughs> Fun and games on the old plantation. <laughs> Danny, are you sure there's any loot around here? Yeah, it's around here, all right. All we got to do is find it. Mon repose. My ancestral estate. 27 rooms of dust, rats, and vanished glory. A thousand acres of swamp land around here, and it's all mine. You know, the more I think of it, the more I believe we ought to stay here. I mean, the police would never think of looking for us here. Now, they might in South America. You know, they push pretty hard when the rap is murdered. Will you forget about that? We got more important things to do now. Yeah, I'll start hunting for the money. Sure, it's hidden in the house somewhere. See, my family never believed in banks. Tell you what, you keep the Colonel and old Aunt Emily occupied. I'll start taking a look for it. This sword, <laughs> this is the very same sword that Jacques Lejean used at the Battle of New Orleans, and then... Ah, oh, perhaps I'm weary of you with so much family history. Oh, no, no, I go for all that period jazz. I uh, say, uh, well, where's Aunt Emily? I think Sister Emily went for some refreshments. Uh, perhaps you'd like to examine the portraits of Daniel's ancestors. Oh, sure, that'd be swell. <laughs> This is Daniel's great-great-grandfather, Jacques Lejean. He built this house. He looks like he could haunt it, too. And this is Jules, Daniel's grandfather. A most distinguished attorney man. Disbarred and not too, I believe. Was he the one uh, that was buried alive? Why, oh, yes, ma'am, yes. <laughs> A most unfortunate circumstance. But by the time we had him disinterred, he'd passed on anyway. Oh, that was nice. Huh? What was that, man? Oh, I said, uh, that was nice. That you didn't have to dig him up for nothing. Well, uh, I, I never thought of it that way before. But you're right, ma'am. You're absolutely right. And this was Daniel's father. It was he who insisted on exhuming Grandfather Jules. Oh? It was a nasty business, man. We, we found the body. Turned over in the coffin and all the fingernails ripped clear off from clawing at the lid. It so upset Daniel's father that when his time came, he insisted on being buried with a telephone. In his coffin? He was buried with a telephone in his coffin? Actually, it was a good idea. Oh, sure. Huh? Uh, I said, sure, it is a good idea. In case your watch stops and you don't know what time it is. 
Yes. Yes. You see, he, he felt that if by accident he was buried during a cataleptic seizure, the telephone would, shall we say, expedite his recovery. Oh, there's no doubt of that. No doubt at all. Uh, say, uh, who is that swell lady? Ah, that is Daniel's great-grandmother Susan. A most high-spirited lady, Bat. Dispatched a carpetbagger with her own hands. Poisoned him with elderberry wine. How about a little wine, my dear? It's elderberry. I make it myself from an old Lejeune family recipe. Uh, uh, no, thank you. Uh, I think I'll go to my room and lie down for a little while. Colonel Jackson. Well, thank you, Sister Emily. <laughs> Outside where? I've been down saying goodbye to nephew Charles. Charles is dead. And buried where he was meant to be, in the lower vault where his ancestors are, where all the men of the Lejeune family have been buried, except you. Yeah, well, I ain't ready to be buried yet. Now, look, I found this hidden up in Charles's room. Yes. Where's the key? You have no need of the key? Now, Aunt Emily, I want the key. I think we could give him the key, Sister Emily. Well, if you think so. Now, it's the little brass one. Thank you. The money. It's in here. Now, where is it, Aunt Emily? The money that I know good brother Charles must have left. And that this family would never keep in a bank. The dead don't need money, Daniel. Look, I told you to stop that. I ain't dead. Your grandfather, Jules, kept saying he wasn't dead, too. But he was. I think we should tell, Daniel. Money's in your coffin, my boy. Since you weren't using it, it seemed a safe place no one would look for it. Yeah, in my coffin? Yes, Daniel. $50,000 in the secret lower vault where the Lejeune men lie. $50,000 hidden in my coffin. It all smells like rain, Sister Emily. <laughs> Lighting the other tools. All right. Oh, Danny, there's water in there. Yeah, I don't think this is waterproof anymore. This is a secret hideout for my pirate ancestor. Since he was a practical man, he used it as a barrel ball. Would you cut the lecture? If there's any money in here, let's grab and go. Yeah, all right. All right, come on. Look at that. It's my brother Charles, the respectable Lejean. Ah, his grandfather Jules. Remember, he's the one I told you about. Aunt Emily heard him hollering from the car. Forget it, forget it. This will be the space reserved for me. Yeah, look at that. Daniel Lejean, June 13, 1926, October 5th, 1961. Huh. They must have really believed that story they heard out of Chicago. Would you forget, Couture? The water's freezing. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Well, right, here, take this. Now we'll open up the family strong box. Give me that hammer. Yeah. Money, it's the money. 
Yeah, she was telling the truth. <laughs> and it's all in tens and twenties, too. Easy to spend, no questions asked. Well, just don't stand there. Come on, let's get it and go. Oh, now, wait, wait, wait. I gotta get something to put it in, don't I? myself a trifle wet. Oh, you surely did, Sister Emily. Now, why don't you go over and dry out for the fire? Then we can start our evening music. All right, Colonel. I think that would be very nice. Very nice indeed. Up in here with Grandfather Jules, that's all. She'll come back, the crazy old goat. That goat is crazy like an old fox. Now look, she'll come back. She's got to. But, Danny, what if she doesn't? What if she doesn't come back? Look, there's a way out of here. There's got to be a way out of here. Damn! listen to me. I got it, I got it. What? Oh, no. What, no, what? No, 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 it's too far out. It's, no. What? Well, I, I, I was just thinking... You might use the telephone. The, the telephone? Yes. Well, you get to be the craziest L.A. I've ever thought of being. What are you talking about, the telephone? The telephone that was buried in your old man's coffin. What? <laughs> yes. Well, weren't you here? Weren't you here when they buried your old man? No, I was up at Statesville. Now, what is this about a telephone? Well, the telephone? The colonel told me. You see, what happened to that grandfather Jules shook up your father so much. He insisted on being buried with a telephone in his coffin. <laughs> a telephone in, in, in Papa's coffin? <laughs> All right. Oh! Come on, come on! Yeah. Huh? Yeah. All right. 
But I can't hear you. Yeah, all right. All right. All right. She said, wait, she's gonna get the sheriff. Hello? Hello, sheriff? Yeah. Hello, sheriff. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, you gotta come over to the, the, the Lejean place. Yeah. Mile repose. Yeah, we're in the mausoleum. We, we're locked in in the vault. What? What? It's a bad connection. What? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all right, I will. All right, uh, I'll be patient. Uh -huh. He, uh, he said, uh, he said, be patient. He said, uh, oh, wait. Yeah, now, now, see, that means he's gonna come. Uh, he's gonna be here in, in about an hour, that's all. And, and in a couple of weeks, we'll be in South America. We'll be in South America with $50,000, see? <laughs> oh, because my father was a screwball. <laughs> thank you, Papa. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, baby. <laughs> Did he recognize Sarpos? He thought you were the operator and I was the chef. He was so excited he wouldn't give me a chance to talk. I don't suppose he realizes the telephone only connected here with the house. Do you think I should try to call him back and tell him? No, I don't think we should. Daniel just isn't used to being dead yet. He won't accept the fact that he and the girl have to stay buried. If we let them think someone's coming, that'll make it easier for both of them then tomorrow or the next day. They'll be much calmer. Then I can go down and we could have a nice little chat. I think we ought to go on with our music, don't you, Colonel? <laughs> <laughs>